um, uh, I had a presentation from the past that I've modified a little bit, and um, that presentation actually was managing all types of bunks, piles, and bags. Um, but I've kind of focused this uh, more on the uh, bunker silo standpoint. Um, I think the important thing for today is that um, I'm what I'm going to present is most of this information is not new. But what I'm going to try to do is to explain what's going on uh, relative to bunker silo management and some key things that you might want to think about uh, in terms of uh, preparing new bunkers or managing existing bunkers and why this management actually makes a difference and, and uh, how we can optimize this, okay? So um, to start off with, um, I want to start by saying that we've got to remember what the goals of making good silage are. And I usually talk about two steps of making silage. Um, one is what we call the front end of fermentation, where we really want to have rapid preservation uh, for maximum recovery of nutrients. So we want to have fermentation occur as quickly as possible and end as fast as possible, because the longer that fermentation occurs, the more dry matter, and energy we lose and the greater potential that we might have undesirable fermentations occurring within the silo. So the front end of fermentation is where things are kind of moving and there's a lot of metabolic activity uh, occurring. Um, the back end of fermentation is storage, is where we want to have good shelf life and good aerobic stability. And so we want to be able to make a high quality product that we can keep for a long period of time because we may not be feeding some of this silage obviously for seven, eight, nine months, maybe, maybe sometimes a year. Okay, um, probably the most important things that people need to remember when they're making silage is that there are two phases of the silage process where you actually control and can have a large impact in what you actually feed to your cows. And these are, you're going to see what happens is that there is an interaction between harvest quality, and so that is the maturity that you bring your crop in at, uh, with silo management. And these obviously can have profound effects on what the animal is getting. And I'm sure that many of you have kind of seen these scenarios. I always have this scenario in, in almost all my talks because I think it drives home the message about how important forage quality at harvest is and what you do with it in the silo is relative to animal performance. So in the first scenario, let's just say we start off with poor quality forage from the field. So, you know, it doesn't matter why, but let's just say it was a drought year or we had a, a crop that got rained on and sat in the field for several days longer than we wanted it to do. If we follow that with poor silage management, we're gonna end up with poor quality silage to feed our cows all year round from that silo. So I think that's pretty much um, a given. Uh, the next scenario is that you have poor quality forage in the field. Um, again, the crop got away from you, the weather was bad, um, overly mature or overly dry. And even if you're an excellent silo manager, you're still going to end up with poor quality silage because you, you can't change what's coming in from the field quality wise within the silo. The most that you're going to be able to do is more or less maintain quality. And that's our goal. The third scenario is probably the worst scenario, which is you start with the best quality forage in the field, but then you follow it with some poor silage management, and now you end up with poor quality silage again. So I think you can see where we're going is that out of these four scenarios that you're faced with at every harvest when you make silage, we want to try to be in this last category here where we've got high quality forage from the field, uh, good silo management, and so we have high quality silage to feed to our cows. I guess the most important here for you as a producer to think about is that, you know, you actually have quite a bit of, of control over when this high quality forage is ready to be chopped, so you have to make an assessment. When, when does that material need to be brought in relative to stage of maturity, since we know that stage of maturity uh, uh, ultimately affects uh, digestibility, et cetera. And then you also control the silo management as well, hopefully, um, covering, packing, 
inoculant chop use. And we'll cover some of these things that are general silage management things that have obviously fall under bunker silo management. Um, the thing that we also see in many of our publications is people talk about dry matter losses within a silo. So we need to understand, first of all, that in a perfect world, we would want to have dry matter and energy recovery at 100%. Um, but the perfect world isn't out there. And depending on what publication you read, I think you'll see that even under good management conditions, people probably end up losing as much as 8 to 10 to 12 percent of the total dry matter when they make silage. So this loss is, is pretty much inevitable. It's going to happen. Um, the lower we can get that number, the better, obviously. Uh, you can see under poor management, we could lose as much as 20 to 40 percent of the material going into the silo. And certainly within our silo system, there are different places where we can lose this dry matter in the whole process from field to cow. And the first part would, part would probably be in respiration. Uh, we have very minimal respiration losses when we make something like corn silage because it's direct chopped. But when we wilt uh, our, our alfalfa crops and wilt our, our early spring grass crops, um, respiration losses could be huge uh, depending on how long this material is sit out there sitting in the field. Uh, we have to remember that even though material is mowed in the field and wilting and drying, that plant material is still alive and it's still using up sugars uh, trying to uh, maintain its metabolic basis. And so the key when we are wilting crops is to try to minimize the time that it takes to wilt these crops down to obtain a um, optimal dry matter for going into the silo and minimize that time while it's wilting so that we can uh, lower these respiration losses. Fermentation losses are also inevitable. Um, even under good management, they may be in this four to six percent range. Under poor management, if you've gone under um, a very high yeast type of fermentation, which makes a lot of alcohol. Uh, these lose a lot of dry matter, although the energy recovery is good. You tend to have very poor fermentation um, uh, loss or high fermentation losses, et cetera, in clostridial type of fermentations. Um, these could easily be 10 to 15 to 20 percent. Um, you'll see the third category is uh, seepage uh, run uh, or runoff. And under good management, you're gonna have no seepage. Under poor management, where a crop goes up too wet, uh, you know you could get a significant amount of seepage or leachate coming from a silo. Uh, that could lead to dry matter and energy losses, and of course also uh, lead to um, in contamination to the environment as well. Uh, the last category where we can get some losses would be storage losses, which I call aerobic losses. And these are losses that could occur during storage, uh, either because of uh, low pack density, uh, poor silo management from uh, holes in the plastic or holes in the door of a silo. Um, it could also be poor pack density that causes uh, air infiltration into the mass. It could be also poor management at the face during feed out. But in total, we want to try to get this good management loss number down below 10% if we can. The lower we can get it, obviously, the better. Um, again, uh, just to reemphasize why all of this is important is because there is a cost based on poor management. And I just have a lot of numbers here. You don't need to look at all of them. But what I'm trying to point out here is if you're a poor manager and you're losing 15 to 20 percent of your crop in in the silo because of some type of poor management system you're going to just lose more money based on the number of tons you put up per year and the value of the crop and you could easily make this assessment for your particular farm if you would estimate the total tons of silage you put up each year uh, multiply it by 10%, multiply it by the dollars per ton that you think that crop's worth, and multiply it then if you've got a good management at 10 or poor management at 20, what that could mean in terms of dollar figures for you. The other problem that we see with 
uh, uh, poor silo management is that not only do we, do we lose a large amount of dry matter losses here, but one can almost expect losses in milk production and increases in concentrate costs as well if we're feeding very low quality silages. So especially in today's um, market where milk prices are, are, are very low, we basically want to do everything that we can to try to ma maximize the recovery of dry matter and nutrients that go into our bunker silos so that we can have better net farm income. I'm going to start off first by showing you um, an ideal fermentation and good storage uh, scenario. So I'm going to show you the front end of fermentation and the back end of fermentation and what happens under ideal situations. So the first thing that happens when silage is chopped is that we release sugars and release moisture within to the silage mass. And if we get the air out of the system, as you'll see here, <coughs> sugar content basically declines over time within the silo. Good lactic acid bacteria take that, those sugars and make lactic acid. Because lactic acid is a strong acid, it lowers the pH. And of course, there are some other acids and some low level levels of alcohols that are also produced normally within a fermentation. The most important thing that I'd like to point out here is that you can see that there's a lot of things that are changing early during the fermentation system. But as time moves on, you can see that we start to reach a plateau or a steady state. The faster we can get silage fermentation to occur and reach this steady state, the more dry matter and energy we will recover from within the system. If in the back end of storage, we keep air out, we end up with a stable high quality product that basically is under steady state conditions, no changes. And of course, there's always some heating that occurs during the front end of fermentation because of the metabolic processes, but over time, all of this material uh, should settle down and reach um, a plateau of steady state as well. So this is ideal fermentation, ideal storage. I'm gonna show you later in the presentation how this might change if conditions during storage and feed out um, are, are not at our best. So as we talk about bunker silos, I have um, some things that we need to consider uh, relative to new bunker silos. So in case anyone's thinking about expanding, uh, building a new silo, um, the first thing obviously is that we, we really should determine our inventory needs and our feed out rates. And if you look at the bottom of this slide, I'm gonna jump ahead here. I've put the link to the University of Wisconsin Team Forage page here. And if you just copy this link here and stick it in, there's a huge page that comes up. And, and down uh, in the page are many different resources that you can use that can help you determine how big of a bunker silo do you need relative to your herd size, relative to your feed out rates, relative to what expansion you might have. So that information is all there. Um, it's obviously much more than I can talk about today, but that page link is a great one for resources in the future. Um, you should also plan to have a clean location for these bunker silos away from groundwater so that if there is leachate, that that material um, doesn't get there or you need to have a buffer zone there. The one thing with most bunker silos that I see especially in expansion dairies, is there is this temptation to have large silos with short walls. And you should avoid <laughs> that temptation to build bunkers this way, because what this does is that it increases the surface area that's potentially exposed to air. And we will see later in this talk that surface areas of silages exposed to air are really uh, something that we want to stay away from because air is the worst enemy of silage. Um, some other, just some other things to think about, um, especially with planning. Um, I see a lot of silos around the world where I go to where um, there are actually slopes back into the silo face 
which is a real no-no because what that does is leachate then comes back into the feeding phase. Melting ice and snow comes back into the feeding phase. So you wanna make sure that these silos are sloped away about a 1% grade um, for good drainage. Uh, just some other things to consider depending on where you're located um, and, and how your, your, your land setup is, is based. You know, you might wanna consider putting a silo so that the face is away from the afternoon sun um, because obviously in the summertime, the afternoon sun is gonna heat that face up and cause challenges for aerobic stability and possibly have the face away from prevailing winds and rain so that you um, um, keep the uh, contamination from rainwater at a minimum. Okay, um, as we talk about good silo management, uh, all the things that you've heard about are still here. <laughs> proper moisture, chop length, packing, covering, and keeping the air out. And this is what we'll talk about today. Um, probably the first things besides forage maturity would be what is the dry matter of your crop? And there are ways that you can assess this um, by taking samples in the field, either through a microwave dry matter, uh, a peer, a coster tester, um, I'm sure that you, your people up in Vermont, the nutritionists and extension services, um, there, there probably are, especially during corn silage times, um, dry down days where you can bring samples to the forage lab or to an extension site and get these samples tested for you. Um, I can tell you that it's very difficult to assess the dry matter of a standing crop, especially corn and especially in a drought year because a crop could, be, could look completely fired up but all the water's in the stalk, it's not in the leaves, folks. And so just looking at a crop, um, it may look too dry when actually it might be actually too wet. And that's actually a phenomenon that occurs almost all the time when we have drought years. It is usually the first calls for corn silage going up is that I chopped and it's too wet, but it looked like it was too dry. <laughs> Um, and that's because people don't test. So testing for dry matter is really important because it gives you a, a better accurate prediction of what's gonna go into the crop, into the silo. Uh, here's actually an example. Uh, these are two crops uh, about uh, 50 yards apart. Um, this is one of my Brazilian students from many years ago. Um, can you guess what the dry matters of these two standing crops are based on the color of what you see? because this is what it actually was. <laughs> They're really not that different, even though the crop on the right looks like it's probably 50% dry matter, it really is only 34. And so test and don't guess. All right. Uh, chop length's also important before, <coughs> excuse me, putting things into the silo. Um, your processed corn silage can probably go in at a, what we call a three quarter inch theoretical chop. If you're unprocessed, you probably want to go in at about a three eighths to a half inch theoretical chop. I apologize that this is in millimeters, but this would be about three eighths to a half inch. This would be about three quarter to about an inch or so. Uh, certainly, one of the things that you would want to do is that if your dry matter was higher than 45%, you'd probably want to back off on the chop length and pick your battle. And the battle would be is that if my crop got away from me and it was putting material up very dry, I'd probably wanna chop it a little finer so that it packed better in the silo and then deal with the fact that I might be short with some effective fiber later. Uh, if I put up material very dry and had a very large chop length, I'm probably gonna blow this material up in the silo and that's not the battle that I wanna fight. Um, I'm not going to go through uh, all the Penn State PAN recommendations, excuse me, but you can find these on the web. Um, but the best thing that I would make a suggestion for you to do is that is to use the Penn State boxes or the Z boxes, whatever you're going to use to assess uh, physically effective fiber in, in these crops, to use it at the time of harvest. Um, the, 
what I hate to do is go on a farm in December or January with a, with a, a Penn State box, box out all their silages, and then have to tell them that this material was either too fine or too, or too coarsely chopped. It's too late. So try to get these things in at the time of harvest so that you know what's going in is at the correct chop length. Um, another thing that you would need to do uh, in trying to manage your bunker silos is to determine what type of inoculant you need. Um, I'm not going to talk much about inoculants other than this slide, but you should determine uh, what your biggest challenges are. Uh, we have homolactic acid inoculants in the field uh, that are designed to improve dry matter recovery, increase the rate of fermentation. Uh, these could be used for wet forages, uh, alfalfa crops that have high buffering capacities, etc. On the other hand, there are L-butaneride based inoculants that are designed specifically to improve aerobic stability. Uh, these types of inoculants probably should be used in things like corn silage, high moisture corn, snaplage, earlage, and drier silages that are uh, greater than 40% dry matter because drier silages tend to pack um, more loosely and usually ha have greater challenges with aerobic stability during feed out, especially during hot weather. There are also combo inoculants in the marketplace as well today. These contain combinations of both homolactic bugs and the lactobacillus buchneri bug. And certainly, if you cannot choose which is best for you between the homolactic and the buchneri organism uh, independently, then I would suggest that you go with one of the combos that contain both because then it's kind of like an insurance policy and you're covered at both ends. How much of a difference are you seeing those make? Because I know one of the questions <clears throat> farmers have about any extra input is, is it worth the money? Is there, is there good data out there to suggest that using a homolactic on forages is gonna uh, pay? Yeah, so my answer to that question is, this is the time when milk prices are low not to try to cheat on something with especially a homolactic inoculant that has the potential to improve your dry matter, your energy recovery, improve your aerobic stability. I mean, th your forage that you have in your silo is, is the base of your whole diet, right? It's homegrown, usually the least expensive, but having said that, blowing up your silage in the silo by not using an inoculant uh, will lead you to low intakes, low milk production, off feed. Um, so the data, if you look in the literature, would suggest that using homolactic inoculants, uh, there's probably a three to, to four to five to one payback in saving anywhere between three to 5% dry matter recovery. The Buchneri type organism, if you can improve aerobic stability and prevent depressions and in intake, especially during the summer months because of the potential to have hot moldy feeds, that certainly uh, would pay for itself too. So I think that because of where we are today, the homolactic inoculants and the l inoculants should certainly be used today, even though they appear to be expensive, the payback is there. Of course, we have to think about uh, kernel processing as well, um, if you're putting in corn, because again, uh, one of the things we wanna do, especially today with uh, low milk prices, is to maximize the utilization, of all the energy that we have, especially from our homegrown feeds right? And so we cannot afford to be feeding poorly processed corn silage and having starch digestibility being poor because we're basically wasting our nutrients that we've um, planted and harvested. Uh, we realize that corn kernels uh, have this very hard pericarp over the shell, which prevents uh, digestion by rumen microbes and the cow's enzymes and we must break these kernels down to, to increase the surface area. Uh, there is a corn silage processing score that has been out for many years 
it is something that you have to send into the forge lab. Um, they will tell you that you are optimum, average, or inadequately processed based on the percent of starch passing through a 4.75 millimeter screen. Optimally processed corn silage has 70% of the, of the starch in that sample passing through the 4.75 millimeter screen. Inadequately processed corn silage will have less than 50% of the starch passing through the 4.75 millimeter screen. Now, having said that, the issue with poorly processed corn silage is the fact that we end up with high fecal starches. And fecal starches can be analyzed by forage labs as well. Um, producers can work with your nutritionist or your extension agents, collect samples, send them into the forage lab that can actually do the analysis. Um, if we see fecal starches greater than about two to 3% in lactating dairy cows, we feel that there are potential problems here and we can improve on the process here. This graph from um, Brahmin and Kurtz basically shows the relationship between kernel processing scores and fecal starches. I had said in the previous slide that when processing scores are a at 70 or above were optimal. And that would equate then, if I went to this axis, fecal starches of less than two to 3%. But as you can see, when your, fecal, when your kernel processing score declines, the percent of fecal starches increases. And this is pretty much a waste of nutrients because instead of the cow, and the rumen bacteria being able to digest the starch to make energy, this is going out into the feces. One of the classic studies that was done several years ago was by Jimmy Ferguson at the University of Pennsylvania, where he actually looked at fecal starches here from two to 12% and starch digestibility in the track, 100%, 90%, and 80%. And you can see, as you would expect, when fecal starches are low, starch digestibility is high. When fecal starches are high, starch digestibility is low. And based on uh, Jimmy's work uh, with multiple herds in the Pennsylvania, Maryland area, they came to the conclusion that a 1% unit decrease in fecal starch was equal to about a pound more and more milk. So if you could imagine, if you had a fecal starch on your farm that was 10% and you were able to, to decrease it down to let's say 4%, you're, you're talking almost about a three pound, uh, um, um, a, a four or five pound increase, excuse me, a five, six pound increase, sorry, of potential milk production, which is a significant amount of milk that you're leaving on the table. Now, one of the issues that we have with the corn size processing score is that it is a test that you have to send in and probably the quickest you can get a turnaround is maybe a day to a day and a half from the forage lab. Uh, oftentimes, maybe that might be too late for you because you're already out of the field. <laughs> so there are some thumb rules for assessing degree of processing on farm um, and that is that 95% of kernels should be cracked. And the caveat here is that of these 95% of the kernels that are cracked, 70% or more should be smaller than or equal to a third or a quarter kernel size. The reason that I say this is that if you see the picture here on the right and you look at the kernels, look at the ruler, but also look at this square. This is the square that has a 4.75 millimeter square. The only way that any of these starch, granule, starch uh, uh, corn kernels would get through this hole is that they have to be smaller than this hole. And this is a 4.75 millimeter screen. This is what the corn silage processing score puts your corn silage samples through. 
So when you look at this sample here, I would probably guess that none of these kernels would actually pass through this, score, this hole, which would mean that none of these pieces are adequately processed enough. Does that make sense to people? But when you see that, that's a pretty scary proposition. <laughs> because I think most people looking at this picture, if they didn't see this hole, would say, look, every kernel is probably cracked or crushed. That should be good enough. But based on the corn silage processing score, I would say that none of these kernels are cracked well so, enough. I want to pause you right there. Have you guys ever done a fecal starch uh, from your cows? No. Um, does your, has your nutritionist done one of these uh, tests to see what your processing score was? Where, where did you find yourself? I can't remember. Can't remember. Was it, it depends whether the whether I did the processing or whether the commercial guy did it. Yeah, so one of the challenges is sometimes um, uh, custom operators tend to be in a bit more of a hurry than the farmer. Right, 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 exactly. So, yeah. Um, how about you? Oh, we've never done the best, but you can see that the corn is not going to process as well as you Okay, okay. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and this is the conversation that you need to have with your, <laughs> with your, uh, with your custom person because this is affecting your your net income yeah i mean it's actually it's one of the <laughs> it's one of the reasons that it's uh, i don't know uh, the cornfields around here are pretty small and so it's hard to have own enough equipment to justify or, or or to justify owning the equipment so sometimes yep. you're kind of left with that but it is a lot of money like you're pointing out that you could be leaving on the table yeah now one way that you could take a look at this is uh, do the bucket of water test. Mm -hmm. uh, you can do this on farm and you can do this quite easily with freshly chopped corn forage coming in from the field. This does not work with corn silage that's already in your silo. Okay, mm -hmm. You cannot go to your silo today, take a couple handfuls and put it in a bucket of water and do this test. It doesn't work. Uh, but this will work on freshly chopped corn forage within a day or so. Um, get a 20 liter pail or 10 liter pail, put a couple handfuls of chopped corn forage into the pail, swirl it around. Um, what will happen is that all the cobs, the husks, the shanks, all of this material will float on the top. And if you swirl this around slowly, all the kernels will basically fall to the bottom of the pail. And what you can do is after putting a couple handfuls in and swirling it around, let it sit for a, a, a few seconds, then use your hand and try to grab out as much of the large particles by hand from the top. You're not gonna get it all off. And then pour the water out slowly and help the floating material to leave the pail. Don't empty the whole pail out. Leave a couple of inches of water, fill it back up with water, and slowly pour the water, again, helping all the floating material out. By about the second or the third wash, you should be able to see at the bottom of the pail a sample that looks like this, where it's just kernels of corn. And if you look at this sample, you certainly will see some pieces like this, 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 that probably won't go through uh, the 4.75 millimeter uh, screen, but many of these other particles like this that are probably a third or a half of a kernel and smaller are gonna get through. So this sample is probably an average process sample um, could be processed a little better. Um, I see, I still see too many s samples of kernels like this, 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 this big halvesy here. These probably are not going to get through the screen, but they're not the majority of what's there. But you have to make a, a um, um, you know, a, a user judgment assessment based on the thumb rules of, of this. So what does it take, what is it um, required of the person who's doing the, the uh, harvesting 
to bring a 50% down to a 10%? Is it is it so expensive that the person, the farmer, the owner, should is it worth his while to say, look, I'll give you an extra so much money if you slow get down. It down to 10%? <laughs> well, what's it worth? Yep. <laughs> yeah. Um, you know, there are there are <laughs> There are obviously incentive programs out there. I mean, the custom, the harvester industry is, is as, as broad as you, one could imagine. Uh, I mean, I've worked down in Florida quite a bit and there are custom harvesters there that are paid um, and get docked if um, dry matters aren't within a range. And you could see that that could go into um, kernel processing as well, that you could say, you know, if you hit this, I'm going to give you your, this number, but if my processing scores are poor, then, you know, what is that worth to me? Now that is an interesting concept because one has to come up with a dollar figure on that, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but my guess is that if the processor, uh, if a harvester is saying something, well, I'm going to charge you for example, and, and this is an easy example, so, th so there's no easy answer to your question, but here's, a, here's an example. If I have someone with a shred lids unit, and I know the shred lids unit in general is going to get me a 65 to 70 percent corn silage processing score because the data would show that that's what these shred lids units do. They consistently are able to get high processing scores. And the custom harvester came to me and said, you know, I'm going to give you, it's going to cost you a dollar extra. And that's about what I see with the shred lidge machines, about a dollar extra to have the shred lidge unit on it um, per ton of harvested forages. I'm going to say, okay, I'll pay you that dollar, but you've got to get me that 70% processing score. If you're if you're going to give me a processing score that's less than fifty percent, I'm not going to give you that dollar because you just I'm paying you a dollar, but you're not getting me what you're charging me extra for. So how much milk is there in that? The, the difference. Yeah. Is it worth it to the, the <coughs> farmer to pay that dollar, or, or is it well for 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 me? Yes. If I knew if I knew that. Somebody was going to come here with a shredlage machine and they were going to charge me a dollar extra and they were going to guarantee me a 70% corn size processing score. I would pay that extra dollar. How much milk is there? Um, between if you went from a 70% score down to like a 50% score, right. that could be two or three pounds of milk. Okay, that's all I need. So air is probably the worst enemy of silage. Um, at filling, it encourages undesirable organisms. This can lead to nutrient loss and poor fermentations. Air is also bad because during storage and feed out, it can lead to aerobic spoilage. Uh, one of the big things uh, that I always say is that if you chop it, you got to pack it, folks. <laughs> um, I don't like to see chopped forage in wagons or in piles overnight. If they get chopped, get them into the silos. Um, chopped forages are still respiring. Uh, even if they sit only six to eight hours, uh, there's a huge loss of fermentable sugars. Um, and this is a great way, if you want to try to make clostridial silages, is to leave a whole bunch of forage wagons with alfalfa overnight sitting uh, at the bunker because you will run out of sugars and that section will most likely go clostridial. To show you some data, um, this is the change in water-soluble carbohydrates that are fermentable in corn forages that was, that was chopped at zero hours, but then sat in a forage wagon for 6, 12, or 24 hours. Um, kind of rare that anything's going to sit for 24 hours, but six hours certainly. You can see there's about a 50, uh, 30, 40 percent drop in sugars, and even right here from six hours to 12 hours, you've lost a whole percent of dry matter just by this material sitting in the wagons. Um, here's the other potential problem that we see with this as well. 
yeast and mole counts can increase quite dramatically. And now what we've done is we're gonna inoculate our silo with spoilage organisms. Uh, here's a study with some ryegrass that was uh, delayed filled overnight. This material that went into the silo immediately had no butyric acid. That, that was the same crop, but it sat in the wagon overnight, had 1.65% butyric, 50% more ammonia nitrogen, and a pretty significant drop in digestibility as well. Now the packing is also important in our bunkers. Um, as you all know, um, the early work by Kurt Ruppel at uh, Cornell showed that dry matter losses declined as packing density increased. And this has led to the recommendations of trying to achieve a dry matter packing density of somewhere in the 15 to 16 pounds of dry matter per cubic foot. Uh, having said that, uh, dry matter density is probably not the most uh, accurate thing to try to achieve, and bulk density is probably the easier thing to go for. Um, if you've not heard this, Rich Muck and Brian Holmes for the last several years have been trying to move people away from just looking at dry matter density to something called porosity. And then from a practical standpoint, because porosity is difficult to measure, to actually use the measurement of what we call bulk density. So the problem that we have in the field is that dry matter density by itself really is an inadequate measurement of air movement into the silo. And this is the problem that we have is if air moves into the silage mass, we end up with aerobic instability and spoilage. Porosity, by definition, is a better measurement of how air can move into the silo, but porosity itself, unfortunately, is very difficult to measure. And so the measurement that, that Rich and Brian would like people to use is something that's called bulk density, which is actually even easier to measure than dry matter density or porosity. The recommendations now would suggest that if you can keep bulk density at 44 pounds of as-fed silage or forage per cubic foot, you will end up with porosity being where it needs to be, which is somewhere between 0.3 and 0.4. Um, and this can be used then across all dry matters, but as you might expect, in order to keep bulk density at 44 pounds of, of as-fed material per cubic foot, this is going to require significantly more packing for a silage that's at 45% dry matter than ones at 35. But, but this should be done, right? It's harder to get the bulk density when the dry matter is high. But when dry matter is high, <laughs> This is when we need to make sure that our bulk density is still there because it's the drier material that doesn't pack well. So uh, one quick question. Uh, somebody asked us how this is measured and I guess along with that, um, seems like this might be one of those things that you can measure more after, you know, as you're feeding it out to see if you hit that target or not. Is there any way to get a sense of how you're doing as it's going in? Yes, absolutely, and this is in the next slide. <laughs> so if you go to the, um, the link that I showed you earlier at the University of Wisconsin Team Forge, there is um, a University of Wisconsin Bunker Density Worksheet, and I've taken a picture of that worksheet here, and you can see that you will have to do a little bit of homework, but you enter your bunker wall height, here, um, maximum height at the crown, what is your delivery rate uh, as fed tons per hour, what is your estimated dry matter content of the material coming in. So you're, you have to know some of these things, right? You're going to have to do a dry matter. You're going to have to kind of know how fast the, the forge wagons are coming in. 
you can put in your estimated uh, layer thickness of packing, which is important. You can also then put in your pack tractor weights and packing time. So this is another important estimate here where you can put in pack tractors and if you have maybe only one tractor that is actually packing and maybe one that's blading in but one's actually packing 100% of the time, but maybe the guy that's blading in is not packing 100% of the time. So he's packing, let's say, maybe material's not coming in at 160 tons per hour. Maybe it's coming in a little bit slower. He, maybe he's packing 50% of the time, but blading in 50% of the time. You can put that estimate in here. But when you put these numbers into the Excel spreadsheet, it actually will predict for you the average bulk density here, which is a wet density, then 44 is recommended. A minimum is the recommendation. And it also gives you the estimated dry matter density as well. But basically what it's gonna do for you is it, it's gonna predict all of this material in here for you. So it'll predict your density, bulk density. It will predict your porosity here and it will pr predict your dry matter density per cubic foot. So these are ways that you can kind of ahead of time uh, predict and see do I have enough pack tractor weight? Am I, do I have material coming in too fast? Um, and then adjust based on where you are with these targets here. Okay? but the tools are out there. Um, the other thing that you can do is you can do um, bunk cores uh, for density and bulk density estimates. Um, I'm sure that you have some around up there, Dan, right? Or some of the nutrition, some yeah. of the, any of the- Nutritionists check that. I, I don't have a bulk density uh, tool. I know they use it for describing soil as well. I'm assuming it's the same yep. type of deal. Uh, yep, you core it, you core in, uh, you, you save the sample, you weigh it, you do a dry matter or just weigh it and you, you measure the whole and then there are equations, uh, spreadsheets on the web that you put this information on and it'll calculate your, your bunk density for you. Yeah, we use those for getting samples. Yeah. Um, yep, but you could use these also with a little bit of, a little bit more information that you collect you could actually end up with a, a, a bunk density estimate as well. I will kind of warn you, I know we're talking about bunkers, not piles, so this is some huge pile, but as our bunkers and piles get bigger and bigger, you have to use very extreme caution around these silos. Um, I would never get to the base of a silo this big ever. Um, it's too dangerous. Um, so please, please use some common sense. Um, there are people literally every year in the U.S. that get killed from uh, silo cave-ins. And we don't want you to be a statistic. Uh, there is research now, significant research on oxygen barrier plastics for covering your bunker silos. Um, these oxygen barrier plastics um, are said to have less permeability to oxygen. And so because oxygen is air, and we want to keep air out of the system. Uh, this is obviously an important thing. This is some work from Italy um, looking at oxygen barrier plastic versus normal black and white plastic. You can see that uh, within this silo, within the first uh, several feet of the, of the top of the silo, the oxygen barrier plastic had more normal uh, fermentations than the, the normal plastic where the lactic to acetate ratio was really skewed and the pH very, very high. Um, sidewall management is also important because we see, uh, especially with silos that have common shared walls, uh, we can see a significant amount of, of water penetrating into the mass here and water is bringing oxygen and leaching nutrients. Um, and so we can, we really wanna try to avoid this type of material here and actually avoid everything that's up here as well. 
And so we can do plastics on the sidewalls, obviously. That's a pretty good thing. Uh, I will warn you that if you do plastic on the sidewalls, you want it when you dr first drape the plastic over the sidewall, you probably want to have something on the form, top of the forms here, to protect, pr protect the plastic from being ripped because the, the edges of the top of the forms here are actually quite sharp. And if you just have plastic hanging over that, they tend to get ripped and have little pinholes in them. So you can use some plastic bags, um, I mean, sorry, uh, gravel bags on the top or a drain tile here, like in this picture that was just split and covered over the wall, uh, carpet remnants, whatever you want, <laughs> old tires to keep that plastic from actually tugging on the side of the wall. And this is some data that we had um, collected uh, several years ago. We had um, six bunker silos at the University of Pennsylvania Marshak Daria that we did some work with, with, with and without sidewalls. And you can see that when we had sidewall plastic, the samples that were close to the wall were almost the same dry matter to the material that was further from the wall versus when we had no sidewall plastic, the samples that were very close to the wall were extremely uh, wet compared to this material. And not only were they wet, but when we looked at the NDF digestibility of the samples, you can see that with plastic on the sidewalls, the NDF digestibility was pretty much the same all the way across, but without plastic on the sidewalls, the samples that were closest to the wall had much lower NDF digestibility. All this material within our bunker should be covered as quickly as possible. Um, thicker plastic is better. You might consider two layers, put a, the thin layer at the bottom, uh, make sure that you have weights on the edges and the seams. Um, this is my poster child of a great bunker silo. Um, reusable tarp, tires touching. You can't see it, but this operator has gravel bags all on the edge, sidewall plastic, uh, bigger tires wherever there's a seam here, uh, especially at, at, the, uh, at the ramp. And of course, I see a lot of bunker silos and piles like this where too much of the face is exposed and not enough tires touching. Uh, of course, one of the questions becomes how long should forge be ensiled in a bunker? Um, we realize that in the real, real world, sometimes <laughs> you're feeding the next day. <laughs> um, in the average world, you're, excuse me, you probably want your corn silage crops to be in there at least a couple of months. Uh, same thing with grass and legume crops, three to four weeks. In the perfect world, I probably would want whole crop corn silage to be in the silo at least four months. High moisture corn, probably six to seven months. And this is based on data from the forage labs, uh, from the most recent paper from Randy Shaver looking at high moisture corn in silos. Uh, his data which would suggest that um, the optimum starch digestibility in high moisture corn probably doesn't reach max into six or seven months within the silo. Um, I realize that in the real world, most people don't have the inventory space and crops to be able to do this, but this is a phenomenon that we know that happens. Uh, corn silage crops, as they mature within the silo, get better and better in starch digestibility compared to freshly harvested material. Now I'm gonna show you in a, the ideal fermentation that I had shown you earlier, but I'm gonna show you what happens during storage and feed out if we are challenged with air and end up with spoiling silages. So you can see how that's quite different from the first graph that I showed you. And all of this movement and spoilage and extra heating is because of exposure to air. So again, I emphasize that air is the worst enemy of silage at filling, but it's also the worst enemy of silage because this can occur during storage and during feed out. And we could basically blow up perfectly good silage that we made here 
and have it destroyed later while we're feeding it to our animals. And of course, air can penetrate into the silage mass um, as much as three feet. And this is even in well-packed silos. You can imagine if the, your bulk density is less um, than 44, and you have poor dry matter density within your silos, the air will penetrate even further than three feet into the mass from the feeding phase. And of course, all these spoiled silages are important to us because we realize that we can make good silage and then end up with poor feed. Losses in dry matter can occur, and obviously poor animal performance can occur with these spoiled silages. And this is the classic work that we all show from Keith Bolton's lab when he was still at Kansas State, where he fed a bunch of uh, backgrounding steers, a uh, corn silage diet that had 5, 11, and 16% of the dry matter of the crust layer that was on top of a bunker silo. And you can see that even with only feeding 5% of the dry matter, of that spoiled silage from the top of the crust layer, there is a depression in intake. And of course, the intake depression got worse as they fed more. But not only do you see a drop in intake, but what they ate was less digestible. And so this is a double whammy. When you feed spoiled feed, you've lost dry matter. So that's a loss of your net income. Your animals eat less and what they eat is less digestible. Another study done by my lab with heifers fed a TMR that was either fresh or spoiled. And when you looked at the nutrient profile, the only difference that, that we could see was that the spoiled TMRs had very high populations of bad spoilage yeasts in them. The protein, the dry matter, the ADF, the starch, everything was the same between these two diets. It's just that these diets had spoiled and heated, and you could see a significant drop in dry matter intake to these heifers fed the TMR. We want to keep plastic down on the, on the feeding faces, whether it's in a pile or a bunker. I like to use these little gravel bags here. It prevents air from penetrating into the mass. Face management is also important. Uh, the magic number is about removal of six inches per day, but this number is really a textbook number. And obviously that number is gonna be more if the weather is hot, if your bulk density is poor. It could be less if the weather is cold and it's freezing and you had a really tightly packed silo. Um, but the thumb rule, is about six inches per day, but you have to use your judgment there. Obviously, you wanna remove more in hot weather, more if you have dry or poorly packed silages, and basically you wanna to try to keep the face as clean as possible to minimize face damage and knock down only enough feed for that um, particular feeding, especially in hot weather, okay? Uh, I see a lot of instances uh, on my travels of things that look like this. <laughs> Um, multiple faces, uh, I call cookie cutter faces, and believe it or not, this silo here was faced with, had a defacer. And so we have the situation of someone having the tool of a defacer, but not implementing the use of the tool correctly, right? And so obvious multiple problems with this silo, multiple faces, silo too big, plastic pulled back too far in advance, still having dirty and poorly uh, managed faces. Uh, and so we need to work on some of these management issues. So uh, as a conclusion, I kind of have my little bunker silo checklist here. These are the things that I talked about today. Uh, first, silo sized correctly. Um, forage crop maturity at your optimum based on what your needs are for, the, for that cutting. Um, pick your correct inoculant. Um, optimize your dry matter, your wilting. Minimize the wilting time in the field for crops that need wilting. Get your chop length set at the optimum. Uh, either 
check with your custom harvester, or if you're the person that's controlling um, uh, the rollers, the processors on your machine, make sure that you're processing at optimum. Uh, make sure that you're checking that you have enough pack tractor weight and sufficient time on the bunkers and piles to make sure that they're packed tightly. Um, have a good covering plan, cover immediately. Uh, use the oxygen barrier uh, if you can. Have more weights on the seams, etc., and have a good feed out plan with a, a facer. So, with that, I think I'm okay on my time, a little over, but um, open it up to questions, Dan. All right. Um, so, <clears throat> as John Gazer mentioned, Lehman is one of the foremost experts in the subject in the field, so you have a chance to ask him some questions. Does he have a recommendation on the defacers, the rotary ones or the rates? Yeah, um, what I see is that um, if you've got a really big silo, um, the rakes are much quicker than some of the defacers, uh, some of the rotary ones. Um, quite frankly, there has been very, very limited research on comparing different types of defacers. And so that information is just not out there in, in relative to things like particle size, et cetera. Um, but I think that I what I would do is based on the size of the silo that you have and the amount of material that you're trying to remove is to work with the equipment people to try to find a defacer that fits your operation the best. Uh, I don't feed cows anymore, but I used to feed out of a bump silo and I knew it was too big. And I always thought that it would probably be worth it to make smaller, you know, thinner in several of them. Yes. And I wonder if there's some formula, <laughs> like, it, it, for instance, if you're feeding four inches a day, what would it be worth to feed, to, to make it so that my bunker silo was the right size so I was feeding six or eight inches a day or 12? <laughs> yeah, actually, there's a, there are bunker sizing uh, Excel spreadsheets and pile silage spreadsheets as well. And on the University of Wisconsin site, Brian Holmes has a couple of articles that actually discuss making that type of decision for you based on the number of cows that you have and the num and how much you're feeding out. And so, for example, um, in the classic example here where they're using uh, the default, I'm going to show you this, go back to the bunker, sorry, sizing spreadsheet. Let me... Let me try to find that real fast here. So that expense of additional yep. silage is something that would would only the expense comes once, but the benefit comes year after year. Yeah. Okay, so if you look at this um, here, and Brian basically says that if you start to get silos. Um, that are much smaller in wall height, you know, you know, eight feet or ten feet, and your and your maximum height starts to get kind of small, and you start to get very wide. That you're probably better off going into either a small pile, or maybe even going into bags. And so there are decision making tools on the web for that. The one thing that you have to take into a caveat is that. You're asking a question that is pretty complex because it's based on the degree of spoilage that could occur, right? Mm -hmm. So on one hand, if you look at, okay, I'm removing four inches a day instead of, let's say, eight, and if all my material is spoiling at four inches per day and my cows are backing off of intake by 15% and my milk production is down by four pounds, you could easily make that calculation and say, yeah, I'm better off having a silo that I'm removing eight inches a day if I could get that number to zero, right? Mm -hmm. But, but, but ha ha making that, that calculation is always, you're, you're, you're gonna have to predict the worst case scenario, right? And, and so one could, in making that decision, 
you could say, well, I'm never going to have that worst case scenario, right? <laughs> but but that's that's the decision that you basically have to make. Do you see very many medium or large size uh, farms going from bunkers to bags? Because I know they make some pretty big bags these days. Yeah, you know, the bag people are going to be really mad at me. <laughs> I, I I don't like I don't like these fourteen foot bags. Okay. Um, I, I don't like the big bags. Uh, you you're down with the smaller bags. I'm okay with them. The big bags I really don't like. I I think they're very hard to manage. They don't pack anywhere near as well. Um, and unless you're feeding out a lot of material in the bags, you're gonna run into, you're potentially gonna run into more aerobic uh, stability problems with bigger bags than you would with a pile that was packed tightly. So what size bag uh, is sort of on the upper end of what you're, you would enthusiastically recommend? Well, I just wouldn't go to those big 14 footers. So you're, if you're 12 feet? 12, yeah, 12 or the, the 10s and the 9s, the 8s, I'm okay with that. But I, I certainly wouldn't go with, with the really big ones. So do you, do you see many people moving that direction or not really? No, I don't, see, I don't see a lot of people move into bags. No. I mean, I see people who make bags work because of their particular situation. <laughs> mm -hmm. Right? Um, but, I, but I don't normally see people moving to bags. I see people moving away from bunker silos with walls to drive over piles as long as they have the inventory space. Because technically what happens is that when you go from a bunker to a pile, it's going to take more pad space because you, you're never going to make the pile usually as high as, 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 as you would the bunker. Unless it's some, you know, I say that when I can give you examples of piles that are 50,000 tons of silage in one pile and have that and are, yeah. you know, 25 feet high. <laughs> That's kind of interesting because you go back to one of your points in your talk was that you should minimize your surface area because air is the worst enemy. And, it is. And kind of drive over piles are the epitome of that. Yeah, but what you but what you do with a drive over pile is you make up for the fact that you have more surface area with better packing. Okay. Okay. A properly sized and managed bunker should be. Yes. Wonderful. Yep. Yeah, I mean, there's no reason to. There's, True. Yeah, there's there's no reason to move away from a from a bunker if your bunker is sized correctly. <laughs> You know what the, the what the what the drive over pile gives you is a number of different things, it, it, even with its limitations. So what the drive over does is that it gives you some flexibility because you can put it anywhere. You're not locked into you build the bunker. I built the walls. I can't move the walls, right? Kind of. Although you know, in the real world, you know, if you're blocked walls, yeah, you could move it if you wanted to. I don't know why you would want to do that, but. But so you have that capability of putting these drive over piles wherever you want. You also have the, the capability with the drive over pile of making small piles, which if you're locked in with a bunker silo with walls, you're locked in with that. And you could, you could, the other thing with the drive over pile is that not only can you put them where you want to, not only can, are they pretty much size um, neutral, so you can put any size, you could make a really small pile, you could make a very big pile, but you could also use the piles to segregate too. And I think when you look at the flexibility of people that are managing or expanding, all those kind of pluses for the pile, even though yes, you have more surface area, kind of pushes people towards the piles and keeps them away from the bunkers. Is a bunker, is it better off to have straight up and down sides than the slanted ones? Uh, <laughs> debatable. Um, I kind of like the, the bunkers with the slanted walls just because you get, you can, as you get more and more to the top, you can get pack a little bit better on the sides versus ones that are completely horizontal. But I realize that 
what it also does too is that it eliminates some of your inventory space, right? Per because you don't have your minus the material that would be here if your wall were straight on the pad. Um, I think in general, I see more traditional straight ups or inversions, not quite as wide as this inversion uh, angle is. Um, but on the bunker sizing and design spreadsheet, all that information here is that you can change all this information on the sizing worksheet. This worksheet that I have here is just for density, but there are actually sizing worksheets based on how many cows, how many tons of silage are you feeding out per day, how much do you want to remove from the face, is it, is it six inches, is it eight inches, and then you can they help you build your silo. Are you able to fill those ag bags are you more likely to be able to keep up with the custom guy or not if you have uh, an appropriately sized ag bag? Um, my guess is that you're going to be probably more challenged with More it. challenged? Okay. I wasn't sure how fast they could put it in there. Yeah, because, cause, yeah, you're, uh, yeah, by, by far, because you, you're not just coming in with a, with a forge wagging it and dumping it and have somebody blading that in. You're, you know, you're taking seven minutes, eight minutes to unload a wagon. Yeah, okay. Any other questions? I mean, I have, you know, I have a small dairy at the university here. Yeah. And we don't have bunkers. We have a couple uprights and then everything else is in bags. And the and for us, it's kind of a historic thing. Um, the bags work really well for us because we can segregate mm -hmm. lots of different crops. Yeah. And we do our research studies. We may only have 100 tons or 120 tons of, of one variety put up at a time. Um, so it gives us that flexibility. Um, it also gives us the flexibility of moving the bags around from different sites at the farm. Because uh, if we needed a, a small bag at the beef unit versus at the dairy unit. Um, so I actually like bags from that standpoint. But my situation is is you know, not the norm, right. but I've worked with, you know, I work with, uh, you know, guys down in Florida and you can go, if you go down to MacArthur's farm and, and, you know, they, <laughs> they put up like, I don't know, everything is put up in bags and it's just, and it is just, you know, thousands and thousands of tons of silage in bags and they like their bags. You know, they, they've made bags work for them. Um, they don't have the big 14 foot bags. Um, they have the, they go up to 12 probably. They have, um, they actually have a person that kind of cores out um, and makes a little ridge uh, in, the, in the land that the bags actually sit in. They manage their plastic at the feed out face really well. So they'll have guys that come and cut the plastic and they actually use the plastic as a staging area while they're feeding out so that the plastic is actually laid out open. And so it kind of helps to eliminate chucking some of the dirt and the mud while they're taking this material out. It's kind of a cool system. Mm -hmm.